Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. My name, my name is Rick, a.k.a. the Lady Reign of Terror. And I came by that name many years ago from one of my drag mothers. And that was one of my drag daughters, just born. <laughs> Miss Abby Normal Terror. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because part of who we are, especially in a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community, it's all about identity and especially in fourth step, a lot of stuff comes up for all of us whether you're straight, whatever. Uh, I think it's very important to acknowledge those things. And I want to say, first of all, thank you to everyone that is here today who are survivors. Thank you for asking me to be of service and to speak because you got to work the program, you know, to keep your own recovery going. And I was a really unhappy, sick person before I came into the 12th step, because I was trying to save everyone I loved and not taking care of myself. And that is where the line is in Al-Anon and AA, as far as I understand it. And I only speak from my own experience, and I can't speak to all of you about your experience. I can share and ask you and talk about that. But the real recovery is to get out of these rooms after we've come to meetings and sharing and doing service and helping one another and make it work in the bigger world. That's hard. It's a day-to-day thing. I'm reminded it's a spiritual practice, too. And all of us have a different way of looking at spirituality or religion or what have you. But one of the uh, obstacles to success in Al-Anon that I've learned is religion was number one. Number two was the gossip. Number three was dominance. Honey, you gave me 45 minutes up here. (laughs) You got to work your program with the drag queens, okay? Because I can tell you, I can come up in here and I can take over the whole day. (laughs) Workshop one, hairstyling. Before I was thinking of higher power, I was thinking of higher hair. Workshop two, The Truth Be Told. Isaac Beshevis Singer wrote, Truth walks around naked, and people like to dress it up into the clothes they're comfortable with so that they can deal with it. (laughs) The first from my sponsor, and I am from a group of people that are hunter-gatherers, so, okay, get over the fur work, call your sponsor. But anyway... (laughs) The other thing is, it's a gentle program. The other thing is um, about truth and about acceptance, awareness, action, all of those things I've had to work on through my whole life. And before I go any further, can someone be a timekeeper for me? Oh, okay, great. Why, thank you, Miss Abby Normal. That's so great. Will you let me know when uh, it's... Okay, yeah, no. Let's do like 20, 20, 20. Just give me a thumb. And the last third, cut me off. Okay, all right. I want to take care of y'all too. All right. Um, One of the things I want to do is I was very nervous about coming today because being myself is probably one of the hardest things for all of us in Al-Anon. Being in drag was always so easy for me. Being someone else or what you wanted to do was so easy. Coming into myself was another issue. I was uh, probably about 12, and I got a hold of some James Baldwin books. And there was a quote from him that said, if you turn enough corners, you turn into yourself. And I was like, what the fuck is that about? (laughs) You know, how, you know, but for me... Over the years, and especially in this program, and with the fourth step and talking to other people, I have learned to love myself, 
I have learned to understand where I come from, who I am, and what made me the way I was. And through doing service, I'll share a little bit more about that, um, I was able to discover some of those things that made me up. So I don't speak for the program. The program is in the literature, and I brought a lot of literature because if I ran out of something to say, I thought, oh, I'll just read from the Daily Reader every day of the year. You know? <laughs> but uh, I do want to share a lot of things, and uh, we are to be congratulated every time we come to a meeting because it's a day at a time, and each day is a new experience. And I am wearing um, one of my things from... Um, doing service with hospitals and institutions. At Friendship House, one of the cooks got into programs. She was there for another program, and she got into Al-Anon, and she made me a key holder. And, you know, the fourth concept is participation is the key to harmony. So that's good as a reminder. So when I get up here on stage, I can remind myself, you know, i got to participate. It's not a spectator thing, Okay. The other thing I was going to say is we get here when we're ready and forcing other people to come with us or saying, you know, have you ever thought about this other program? I had a hard time getting here this weekend. I work and I'm in retail and I was really, really nervous about sharing about my anonymity as far as or about my own about 12 step and talking to my boss about taking the day off today because that was so difficult and that's what I mean about dealing with the program outside a room and I was in a meeting in front of everyone and I had sent her you know a little message by voicemail okay and in front of everyone she says now why in the world do you need to be off on that Sunday everyone else is working and I said, well, I have something very important for me to do. I've been asked to speak. And she stopped. And she goes, you have something to say that people want to hear? Sarcastically. <laughs> Sarcastic. Isn't she a nice person? Yeah. But, you know, that's reality. People are like that in the real world, especially in the business world where it's very competitive. And, I mean, she's a good person, but sometimes people don't think about the words they use. And she was stupid around that, and we really should have gone aside and talked about it. So what I said, oh, I called my sponsor. I went outside, and I talked to my sponsor. I said, what the fuck am I going to do? Do I need to read this bitch in the meeting in front of everybody? <laughs> no. Easy does it. Go in. It might be an opportunity for outreach. Honey, I've counted those drinks when we've gone to meetings that she's drinking. That's the al part. I know she has several lavas when we were in Hawaii on business meetings. I know that she didn't stop. And I thought, hmm. Anyway, that's not my inventory of her, but I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway. So when she, I went back in the room, she goes, no, really, I want to know, in front of everyone again. And I thought, okay, this is, is it odd or is it God? And I said, it's actually a 12-step conference, and I'm one of the speakers. I'm very honored they asked me to speak. So she goes, really? But you drink. And I go, uh, yeah, I'm not in that room. There are other 12-step programs. Because, you know, we've, I've had a glass of wine with her, you know, and that kind of thing. But the thing is, that was an opportunity. So sometimes things come up for us that are part of surviving, making a living, but we can also practice the principles in all our affairs. Okay, now to the text. I'm going to take this off because I'm, like, sweating up in here. Yeah. Oh, okay, making me all nervous. I want to do a reading. We've heard some of the readings of detachment. That was a really important one when I first came in. And um, I want to tell you how it was, 
what it's like now. I told you a little bit, little bit about what it's like, you know, dealing with my boss and everything and how I work the program. And I hope that if you get something out of the share tonight or this morning, uh, honey, uh, drag queens are not used to getting up and getting here at 11 in the morning. I used to go to bed around that time, okay? But anyway, it's very important that uh, detachment was part of my life and part of my recovery because I was only as happy as the unhappiest child. I have two sons, both adopted from birth. One is a, an alcoholic who's in recovery and a heroin addict who's in recovery. And the other one was a great candidate for Al-Anon and seems to be moving into the 12 step somewhere else. So we'll see. Anyway, we shall see. But the, uh, I remember the first meeting I went into, are you troubled by someone else's drinking? And there were all these questions. You've seen this pamphlet. There's like 14 questions there. Okay. So if you don't get anything out of my share, go to another meeting. You don't have to listen to drag queens if you have an issue with it. You can hear housewives. You can hear husbands. You can hear the children. You can hear your brother, your sister. You can hear your minister, your rabbi, whoever. But just go to a meeting and check it out because if you get nothing out of what I say, don't give up. Go to several meetings and try it out. Try the program because I would suggest it is what it's what has worked for me. Um, one of the things, do you worry about how much someone else drinks? Well, I told you, I counted my boss's drinks, okay? The second was, and I used to also count the bill. You know, I don't think many alcoholics know how much is being ka-ching, ka-ching. Oh, I could have bought a new wig for that. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Oh, there's a new pair of pumps. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Oh, that's a night at the movies. Anyway, uh, you know, do you blame yourself for others' behavior around drinking? Yeah, I did. It was about, oh, he can't come to work today because, you know what, he's just not feeling well. I think he's coming down the flu. He'll be there tomorrow. Making excuses. So if you see this one around, get a hold of it and check it out. It's great literature. I want to read from the Daily Reader, and then I'm going to move on to some of the other issues. This is from Courage to Change. It's one of the daily readers in al -Anon. And it's from June 22nd. So that's coming up. <laughs> My sharing at early al -Anon meetings went something like this. She makes me so mad. And I am a nervous wreck because of him. Thank God for a sponsor who has always brought the focus back to me and encouraged me to look at what my words really said. When I blamed others for how I felt, I was giving them power over my feelings, power that rightly belonged to me. Nobody can make me feel anything without consent. I had a lot of attitude changing to do. You know, changed attitudes can aid recovery. That's what we say in Al-Anon. Today, my being aware of words I use I am learning to communicate more responsi responsibly. I not only share in a more straightforward manner, but I also argue in a healthier way. There are better ways to express myself than to say, you did such and such to me. I can talk about myself and my feelings. I can explain the way I experienced something rather than telling the other pe person how he or she made me feel. I can talk about when I want and I am no longer a victim. And today's reminder, what do my words communicate? Do they express what I am trying to say? Today I will listen more closely to what my words have to say. We learn in time that it is not subjects which are controversial, but the manner in which we communicate about them and the elements of personal blame we add to them in anger. And that's from the dilemma of an alcoholic marriage. You know, this program has taught me how to deal with other people and how to let go of things and how important some things are to me and how things are not important. What, are the, what is the focus? So in relationships, 
for the first time in al -Anon, I learned how to have a healthy relationship, about boundaries, about having confidences with a sponsor or with sponsees that get, you know, a lot of recovery in that because I wasn't used to that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit how it was, and then we're going to move on because I'm over it. No. <laughs> I grew up in a family. Well, I guess first of all, okay, let me go back. My mother's side is American Indian. They're Choctaw from Mississippi. My great-grandma's name was Lucy, and she, in 1836, was nine years old. And there was a treaty with the American government, and I don't want to get into all the politics of that, but it's very important about who I am and how I am and how I view things. There was a treaty at the Dancing Rabbit Creek that all Indians of the Choctaw Nation had to move to Oklahoma. So they left in the winter, and they were prodded along by soldiers, and many of them died on the way. Her particular brand decided they were not going to Oklahoma, so when they got up to Illinois and Kentucky, they ran off into the woods. Hence, I was born there, <laughs> and it was very beautiful. It was a gorgeous place, but they didn't read or write, and my mother went as far as maybe the fifth, fifth grade. And they put her right away into a factory making gloves and shoes and all the things people buy in the stores. Now we just get it all from El Salvador or Sri Lanka, right? But, you know, in those days, we had our own people. So um, a lot of that shame, a lot of that who we were was not talked about. On my father's side, my father was Jewish. They had lived in this country for about five or six generations, and they denied a lot of who they were also. They, had, they were Southern Jews on top of that. So when my aunt was working in a factory during the war, she met my mother and said, you know how Jews are. They're just like the Indians. They want to match everybody. I have a brother. He is so nice. Would you like to meet him? He drinks a little bit, but, you know, he's really... So they went out, and here I am. Now, when I was growing up, I stayed a lot with my mother's side of the family, and they lived in the middle of nowhere. They had no electricity. They had a well. They had, I mean, it sounds like, could you say Appalachia? Yeah, a lot of people live like that. Not so long ago. That was in the 50s. And we did a lot of things. Uh, they were more loving. They were very warm to me, and they called me Shushi. I've never shared that with anybody. And it, you know what it means? Worm. <laughs> That's the Choctaw word for worm. Because I used to read all the time. I would hide away. You know, that's one of the character defects I had. I would hide away, and I was creative, and I would create this world. But I loved to read. And they didn't understand that. You know, like, what's that about? We would go hunting. We would, you know, my grandpa would take me out. We would fish every day. And we would also, you know, when he would kill a goose in the fall, he would, you know, show me how to dress it and clean it. So I could kill a deer and clean it and all that. And my brother still does that kind of stuff. They're very, I'm the only one that likes dresses. But, um, but the trouble was when I used to go with my uncles and with my grandpa and my brothers and everybody, I would take the feathers and I would start making things out of them. I must have been three or four. So, you know, there was that side of the family. Then, if I went to visit my father's side of the family, they were very, very strict. They had lace tablecloths. They had, you know, bank accounts. They knew how to use checking accounts. They, you know, were very civilized around the table, and you had to have manners, that kind of thing. And I called my grandpa, sir, you know, and you... when. The living room was for going in to sit with Grandpa and what's going on, talk about this or that, and that's where discipline was given. So it was very different, and neither sides of the family talked to each other or had anything to do. Remember, it's the South. Segregation was real big, and my family was mixed. So I'd go play with the cousins on my dad's side, and they would say, you talk funny. <laughs> And then on my mother's side, you're getting real city-fied. 
It was very different. Oh, we have to wear shoes, you know. Oh, I've got some great shoes. Anyway, <laughs> so that kind of stuff, you know, it's always happening. I would go to my uh, grandpa's house, my grandma's on my dad's side, and every Sunday they would come together and have these big dinners, and all the men ate first, and all the women were in the kitchen. Well, I would go in the kitchen, get all the aprons, and make a dress, and I would come dancing out to entertain everybody. You know, I was in my mind, I was like, totally, you know, into this whole, S I probably had seen Hunchback of Notre Dame and remember the gypsy dancing. She was beautiful. And this twirling skirts, in my mind, that was the imagination I had as a little kid, four or five. So I'm coming out twir twirling around. My father grabbed the apron that was on my head and pulled me through. He was very violent and smacked me around and said, threw me to my mother down the stairs and said, get the garb off the boy. And for those I'll translate, garb is like clothing. It's very Southern, very archaic. But get the garb off the boy. We're going to make a man out of him yet. I always heard that. When I went to visit my mother's side and I started being who I was, I would hear my grandma and grandpa say, and I've recently, because of this program, I have started learning the language that they were speaking, the Chanta language. And they, would you get that, honey? <laughs> if they're calling for me, I'm not here. <laughs> my grandpa would say, Kanta hosh chuchi tok on. Who made you? And my grandma would say, Chahoa yak o shabi tok. Oki. God made him. Chihua hache pisha on. Does God see us? You know, like, has God seen what you do? And Chihua ha pisa oke. God sees everything we're doing. All of us. So there was a better judgment there that I got from my grandma and grandpa on that side. I felt more acceptance. They didn't understand a lot of it, but they didn't like try to, great. So is that like 20 more minutes? Oh, great. Okay, we're going to move on to recovery. <laughs> but it was, it, was, um, it was very different. And I think that coming out as a gay person plays a big part in who we are or as a queer person. You know, I think that that is kind of how we are. And we all do that differently, you know. Maybe for you it's like never wanting to play with dolls or wanting to play with dolls. Or maybe you like a Susie Homemaker kitchen set. Or maybe you're just one of, you're that way. That's another phrase people used to say before we had a name for it. And... Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that um, the trappings of identification changed and blurred through my whole life growing up. It's identity. I could be very butch. I could wear total leather. And I could fuck until tomorrow. And I made a lot of money on it, honey. Because I left home at 13. There, by the time I had been beaten and, you know, we talk about in program, uh, we will come to know the vastness of our emotions, but we will not be slaves to them. No longer are we degraded, but we can move on from that. And I'm kind of butchering that part. But basically, we come into ourselves and we get our, our fight about us and we become who we are. And we have a voice. In these rooms, we learn our voice. I was tired of taking it. And I would run away at 13 and go to Florida, and they would catch me. And then I would get brought back home, and my father would say things like, or my mother. My mother would say, where were you? How did you live? What did you eat? What did you do? Well, and I was like, you know, 13. I'm young and stupid. I would go, well, there were all these men that dressed like women. Well, they weren't really women they were men and but they were like really beautiful and sparkly and they we we got money from men and we'd make them feel good my father would yeah he hit me 
And that was it. We don't want to hear anything more about it. You're going back to school next week, and that's it. So when we speak our truth and we get smacked down, it takes us a while to recover from that. When we live with alcoholics and the world is crazy, that's what we're used to. It takes us a while to realize that. When you grow up and the house is on fire every day, all right, I'll call 911. Maybe. I'm doing my nails. You know, it's like you get this whole persona. It takes you a little while longer to react. Sorry about that. Did anyone's hearing aid go off? Okay. But you know what? It's like you've got to really focus on that part of you to take care of yourself. And I had to learn this in the room. Some of those tools, the best tool was having a sponsor. When I first started going to meetings, I would hear people share. And, you know, some of the meetings have those timers. I heard that. I heard that. I'm going to wrap up. I heard that. And then, and, you know, that totally pushed my buttons. And that's why I was here. Because, you know what? We manage, we manipulate, we are martyrs. Hello. Oh, you know you belong here if you throw yourself off a cliff and somebody else's life flashes in front of you. <laughs> Another way, look around the room if they have the imprints of Venetian blinds on their face. Where are they? Why don't they call? Where have they been for three days? That's the al thing. How many al does it take to change a light bulb? Change. <laughs> you know, it's like wearing a pair of old slippers. You get really comfortable in those old slippers that start getting holes and everything. Honey, it's time to get out and get a new pair. And I want to talk about the six Ps. Do you know those six Ps? Perspective, pain, prayer, patience, process, and the payoff. Yeah. The perspective is about that character disorder. You know, like I, I talked about how when I was a kid, one of my coping mechanisms was to disappear and to go into fantasy world, do art, read books, worm, hello. Okay. One of those other things, the flip side of that character defect, was being able to come up with an idea, to do things different, to have a different kind of point of view than somebody else. Three people, eight kinds of views. Pain. We all have pain, honey. Fear. Fear of letting go. That was one of my big ones. I can fix that. I can take care of it. I can change it. I can do it all. I can put together a whole conference. I can be the conference. I'm exhausted. All those things. If you only love me, you would do this for me. That was old behavior. And the thing about that pain false evidence appearing real. Sometimes it's almost like when the next hit is coming from abuse. You anticipate it and it's not there. It's strange. It's almost like from, I've, I've heard other people that have lost a limb. You're used to having that arm or that leg. Then it gets removed. And where is it? I had a heart once. Where did it go? It's buried. A lot of us in Al-Anon bury those feelings. And when I got to the fourth step, I was able to pull some of that out and examine it. How do I feel about? I don't know. Is it salty? Is it sweet? I don't know. I had to learn. Prayer. That's the footwork to have all those character defects removed that weren't serving me anymore. The other thing was with prayer is to have, um, turn it over. That was the biggest part. In the 11th step, learning to fo keep my focus and turning it over. I can't be in charge of everything. And I need to like, I'm having a problem with my son who I think is using or drinking. I'm not going to go look in West Oakland anymore. I'm tired of it. I'm not hunting him down at night. I need to focus on me, get my night's sleep eat a meal, take a bath, hello, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, simple, simple, simple. That's where the slogans kick in, you know, make a phone call, call God, however you may describe him. 
the process, part of that process of letting go of disappointment. Alcoholism robbed me of my childhood. Alcoholism has fucked me up around relationships. Me, not you, me, how I deal with it. I am, my thinking becomes distorted. I get irritable and unreasonable without knowing it. I don't know when I'm really getting ticked off. I saw my roommate told my partner and I last night, or the night before, rather, there was this great movie to watch called Ticked Off Trannies. Have any of you seen it? Show of hands. Anyway, it's very violent. And I had a hard time watching it. I don't like the abuse of trannies. But anyway, it was not about that. It was about, you know, somebody else's perspective. And that's great. Some people would love it, but it wasn't mine. That was part of the process of my grieving and letting go of things. Um, having friends. A lot of us as kids have pretend friends. I could imagine a whole world around me. And this is the real world. This is not the real world. This is not the world. That's not either. Excuse me. Sorry. Are we still here? Then the process, okay? We talked about the grief. Well, the payoff. The payoff is the struggle. It continues to be. Forgiveness. It's about revenge. I used to want revenge all the time with people that did me wrong. That son of a bitch. I am going to make you pay. You are going to hurt. I'm going to make you really hurt. You just wait. You know, these are all Al Anon slogans before I came in. <laughs> you know, this let go and let God, this let it be, you know, easy does it. You know, uh uh, not me. It was all about, I'm going to get you, you son of a bitch. But it's different. Feeling sorry for people. You know, that was the other thing. I confuse pity with love. And then the other thing is the solution. Finding the solution, changed attitudes can aid recovery. Is the glass half full, half empty? That was about attitude. It's a gorgeous day outside. I would imagine if you go out on the street and you ask 10 people, how's your day going? How many of them would say, wow, it's a beautiful day? You never know. So it's about me too, about mine. My defects were resentments, the fears, the jealousy, the self-pity, the dishonesty. When my father and mother used to ask me, did you go to school today? Oh, yeah, I went to school. I was actually hanging out with my friends. I, I had these friends that were great. They taught me a lot of wonderful things. How to go to bars when you were underage. How to dance and the music. They were brothers. They were a lot of fun too, honey. Woo! A lot of it too, um, the part of the grief, I have a lot of rage and resentment about good health. I survived a lot of AIDS friends, you know, friends getting AIDS. I had probably, it's really hard to talk about Alan because um, I normally don't bring him up, but he was probably the soulmate. We related on so many levels and he died when he was 38. But going through AIDS made me have such a distorted picture of the world, fear and scary and all that. And, you know, I have an ex-wife that I was so afraid of the AIDS epidemic because from the time I was 13 till I was about 23, I got off the streets and got my high school diploma. That's when I met her. I was with a boyfriend. I was in an art studio, and she had gotten into recovery. And so the two of us just hit it off because she was an artist, and it was great. We were like two lost children that found each other. And it was perfect. I could take care of her. I could have fun. And she didn't care that I was gay. I mean, it was different. It was the 70s, early 70s and 60s. But I was terrified of AIDS. I really bit into the thought that God was punishing me. And I was going to get it, you son of a bitch. One of these days, you're going to get it. Because you have played around for years. And now it's time. It took a long time to get over that. And I finally realized that's bull bullshit. I'm not buying into all this stuff. And so we divorced. We're still friends. I thought she might be here today. 
But uh, anyway, uh, you know, it's really good to have that. This program, that's one of the miracles. They say don't leave until you get a miracle. That was a miracle for me. It wasn't that I was gay. It was about leaving the relationship and about abandonment and all those issues. But there are miracles to be had in this room with each other. I see miracles every day. You know, yesterday, my partner came home, and we were just getting home from work. And to me, there was a sign. And you may say this is bullshit. But to me, I live in the city. We live in the mission. And there was a three-foot snake coming out of the park, going into the gutter. It was a gopher snake. Now, in the Choctaw culture, it's a good sign. It's, it's a reminder. And for me, that was like higher power saying, you're doing the right thing. You know, don't worry. Things are happening. So, you know, every day, and seeing one in the middle of the city, that's so strange. He took a picture. If you don't believe me, it's, he took it. Because I said, get a picture, get a picture, get a picture. It's on Facebook. Anyway, I'll get that. <laughs> I'll wrap up. <laughs> no, but it's, you know, seeing those everyday things, that's something to be... Um, reckoned with, that we need to recognize those things around us, the people around us that make progress, not perfection, that um, we can all benefit from. And I would suggest go to more meetings, work your program, and if you got anything out of what I said, God bless you, go to more meetings, you know, check it out, and I want to hear from all of you one time or another. So thank you for this opportunity to do service. Love you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.